The following program is brought to you by Bruce Telecom and Whiteman TV. Hello, I'm Adam Olivero, and thank you very much for joining me. I'm here at Leslie Ford in Walkerton. Uh, we want to thank uh, Leslie Ford, and especially Mark Leslie from the Wingham Fort, for sponsoring this documentary on Invisible Wounds. Now, Invisible Wounds conferences are all about learning to support first responders in skills development, peer training, and networking. Uh, what they're doing is talking a lot about occupational stress injuries and how those could affect their work life, their home life, their relationships, and their loved ones. We say could affect because not everybody is affected by occupational stress injuries in the same way as we will learn in this documentary called Overcoming Obstacles. I want to thank Deborah McDonald as well for helping to put together this documentary and again Mark and Don Leslie for sponsoring it. We're going to see from first responders and mental health professionals and there are some situations where if you have an occupational stress injury you may be triggered so I will proceed with caution. The documentary definitely is not for people under the age of 18. So without further ado let's learn more about occupational stress injuries and overcoming obstacles here in our documentary. Here now with uh, Kent Padfield from the King Carden, uh, Municipality of King Carden Fire Services, the Fire Chief. Welcome, Kent. Thank you. Kent, uh, PTSD, um, how has your attitude towards uh, mental health and its effects on emergency workers changed over the years? You said before we got started you had over 30 years in this, in this business of frontline service workers. Correct. So I've been in emergency services for about 32 years now, uh, since 2013 as the Fire Chief for King Carden Fire and Emergency Services. But prior to that, I was a paramedic and then Deputy Chief for Bruce County paramedic services so um, how's my attitude changed I think it's growing matured um, I look back and I have those those calls those emergencies that that never go away yeah uh, some are good some are really passionate and happy stories but there are those circumstances where they stay with you and now it's the realization that yeah they're gonna be there forever uh, they're going to be part of of who I am and it's knowing how to deal with them and, and knowing that I may have other colleagues, co-workers, friends that may be facing those same circumstances as well. So for me it's an opportunity to understand a better understanding of, of how it works and taking away that stigma. Yeah, absolutely. So you said, uh, you know, a better understanding. So over your over 30 years in this business, have you seen the, the awareness improve over those years? Greatly improved over okay. the last, and I can even say that over the last 10 years. We have a better understanding. We are more open about it. Uh, we have great discussions. We now have government support that's saying, you know, it's, it's recognized that it does affect emergency workers. And we now have a plan in place on, on how to help more people when it comes to their mental health, just as a preventative me measures, but also in that response when somebody is suffering. So uh, what is your message then, uh, you know, again, over your years in this, in this business, what's your message to, uh, say, frontline workers about if, if they find they're dealing with uh, this sort of situation with post-traumatic stress disorder? Uh, excellent, excellent question. I think first and foremost is knowing early on in your career, knowing what the signs and symptoms, yeah. uh, know your mental health, understanding what PTSD is. Look for those signs and symptoms. Look for those signs and symptoms in colleagues that you work with. And don't shy away from when somebody says, I'm struggling, um, I'm dealing with maybe some mental health, health issues. Instead, it is just something that we need to work through. It's like any other illness that we may have, uh, that, there is a, a, that we can fix it, and, and we can work with people and improve it. And one of the biggest things, and, and I, I stress this a lot, is let your family know as an emergency services worker 
what some of those signs and symptoms could be. So they may understand you better when you're having those restless sleeps or maybe a little irritable at home or, or not, you know, not focusing like you used to. It's just a, a process how we all work through, you know, through some of the things that we've seen and knowing is better, being better prepared. Yeah, absolutely. I find that when I'm talking to people about PTSD that everybody deals with it in their own way or there's different signs for everybody. So it's a very hard thing to pare down sometimes, especially for somebody like myself that has never been in a super stressful situation that may have caused PTSD to find out if that person is going through it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's, it's important for all of us to, to recognize that we may all deal with it differently. Yeah. Some may don't have, some people just may not have that, that I don't want to call it strength, but just that ability to cope as well as others. Others have great support systems, whether it's peers, whether it's family, whether it's friends. Um, I know for years when I worked as a paramedic, as a frontline paramedic, and I worked with the same partner for nine years. And we could always come back from an incident, sit down and talk, know that we were both kind of analyzing each other on how well we've dealt with it right. and, and working through the scenario. Knowing that I would hope if my partner had seen me walking down the wrong path, he would offer to help and provide me some intervention as I would with other workers. I was in part two, you're the uh, Master of Ceremonies for this Invisible Wounds Conference and I know Deborah is very happy to have you as the Master of Ceremonies, but why was it important to you as the Chief here in King Carden to come out and do this? First and foremost, all those other things that we've talked about, and that is, I now have a better understanding. It's taken me years to recognize that is an important part of the emergency services culture. That is something that we can't ignore. And it's certainly an honor for Concordan and for my department to be part of something like this. Mm -hmm. And having colleagues come from all over Ontario to listen, to learn, to network, you know, to, to deal with things. So it's, it just felt like a, an important thing that I should do and, and again the honor to to be part of it is is great absolutely and I think we were saying before we were recording about like there, there is maybe there is still that stigma and having you as the chief of the fire services here in the municipality of King Carden stepping forward and saying no this is okay to talk about it's probably a big thing for your crew behind you to see as well I've learned a lot over the year certainly as a paramedic and then as a deputy chief and now as a chief um, I've worked with some great people that have championed mental health and post-traumatic stress disorder right. and uh, critical stress management in our workplace. Uh, they're part of actively as part of uh, debriefing teams in our in our in our county. Um, I have staff that are peer-to-peer -peer support members, um, but I've also talked to other chiefs and heard them saying the Bruce County critical stress team came out. They talked to my staff, and now my staff is saying what a world of difference that small intervention made in their understanding of what was going on after the incident and coping with it. So on many fronts it's been a, I think it's just a remarkable journey how we have come to recognize the importance of it. Our government is now backing us and saying yes you need to have a, a PTSD plan in place and making sure our, our workers and our, my employees are, are safe and sound. Yeah that's an excellent thing. Well thank you so much Ken for joining us and for uh, sharing your stories. Thank you. Here now with Randy May, a teacher of mindfulness, and Randy, uh, mindfulness is something that's really coming into its own these days. People are starting to know a lot more about it. So, could you start with just explaining for people that may not know that are watching this, what is mindfulness? So, mindfulness really is staying in the present moment. Uh, and so, John Kabat-Zinn in 1979 came up with a mindfulness-based stress reduction program, and that was bringing in the breath practice into a form of a wellness practice for people who are living with chronic illness or chronic pain and a way to manage the stress in the body. Yes. Uh, but mindfulness really is living in the present moment, non-judgmentally, on purpose. Uh, okay. And so our mind is usually traveling from future to past and back and forth all day long and it's really just getting the mind to be still and present with the body wherever it is. Yeah, and it can be hard too to, to do that when you're starting yes. with it because your mind does not like to be like that. Absolutely. I always tell people like, 
like it's as if you're going to the gym for the first time. We're not going to go to the gym on the first day and lift 200 pounds if we've never been to the gym before, right? So yeah. the idea is start with two minutes, start with three minutes of breathing, four minutes, and keep it going as you progress on your journey. Right. I've heard the phrase uh, like bored and brilliant. You know, there's a phrase that you're kicked around now where people are saying like, we're so on the go these days, going, 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 24/7, yeah. and just to take that break, right? So yeah, take a breath. It's like your breath is a automatic reset button that's in your body and it's free uh, and you could take a pause at any time and, and reset. Right. So how can uh, having mindfulness and compassion practice support uh, some first responders or frontline workers with uh, you know, PTSD or some other illness they may have mental So illness? I think one of the things about mindfulness and a self-compassion practice is the greatest thing is the principle of being gentle with yourself. As a first responder, you know, people know how to take care of other people and support them on their journey and nurture them, make sure they're cared for. Um, but the same things that we give out to other people is the idea of can I give that back to myself? And so mindfulness and compassion helps people to kind of know that it's okay where they're at. Uh, one of the principles of mindfulness is acceptance, letting go, patience, um, being gentle with yourself, looking at yourself with fresh eyes, beginner's mind. So those practices and mindfulness really help uh, an individual apply it to themselves, especially experiencing PTSD and things like that. Uh, it sometimes becomes difficult to think that this is where I am on my journey and sometimes it's hard to accept. I know there's a practice that body scan is really helpful for individuals experiencing PTSD. Uh, there's lots of studies that have been done out there with uh, using the body scan, which is a breath practice practice where you go from your head to your toes and just being present with the different parts of the body mm -hmm. um, and it helps people to be aware of where are they holding stress in the body where is the trauma being held in the body and having like an honest check-in with yourself right oh interesting yeah yeah mindfulness can be one of those things where like you just slow down, right? Yeah, really slowing down to check in like what's happening in my body, what's happening in my thoughts. Right. So what are some things that families can do to stay connected during a difficult time where maybe a family member is going through PTSD? Having a practice where, you know, individuals, especially first responders, are often doing shift work. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe each week setting aside time to really figure out what day or what time are we going to craft to be together and be present with each other, have an honest check-in, how are we doing as a family, what do we need to support each other. Um, sometimes it sounds unrealistic, I know shift work, but <laughs> if you can do it weekly um, knowing what your schedule is and what your family schedule is, that practice of taking time to really check in and say this is what I need from you this week or this is how I can support you this week is important. Right, so like having an open mind and talking, with you, and not just keeping it bottled inside. Absolutely. Absolutely, sharing and letting people know what you need is so valuable because sometimes uh, as a support worker or a caregiver to you know the masses we sometimes feel like okay I can if I can take care of others and I can hold on to my own space and eventually take care of it myself but just as an individual helps others they need somebody to support them too right so then you as a support worker your immediate family becomes your support worker Absolutely. essentially Absolutely. <laughs> and you know and sometimes when things become um, there's more support required outside of the family there's always that extra support there whether it's a counselor mm -hmm. or someone that the family can consult with to see how they can support each other better. Right. So in professions that require individuals to give, nurture, and support others, what would assist them in being aware of their own needs if they get often pushed to the side? Yeah, there's three things that people give to others is being seen, heard, and cared for. Right. Uh, and can I then think about myself in respect to that? Am I being seen? Am I being heard? Am I being cared for? Because often if I don't feel seen or heard, then I start to feel like uh, whether it's frustrated or annoyed and so when those things start to happen just checking in with myself saying where am I being seen heard and cared for today uh, how can I fill that bucket back up yeah because that's the huge part right if the, you get the imaginary bucket if your imaginary bucket is empty uh, then it's, you're in trouble yeah that's this idea that it's empty but I need to take a pause and replenish yes. it and so how can I do that yeah. when did your mindfulness and compassion practice begin and how did it help you face challenges in your career as a counselor yeah um, it started mindfulness came into my life when I was 16 oh, wow. I was grateful to have a social worker um, kind of work with me and teach me about mindfulness and yeah. um, then I had lots of informal teachers during my um, journey from 16 on uh, but it really started to hit home for me 
me uh, when I started my career as a crisis counselor because my first year I lost a colleague to suicide um, and throughout that process you know having my own health challenges the body holding on to stress in different ways uh, and coming up in different responses and symptoms I had to learn how to take care of myself and so having a mindfulness practice I learned Tai Chi which is mindfulness in motion um, di learning different things really but I think the wake-up call for me was losing a colleague mm -hmm. uh, because it really hit home to say okay we're supporting others and there's all these resources around how can we better um, utilize the resources to support each other and support myself uh, and so that was kind of my first wake-up call to that. Well thank you for sharing it's interesting because when people hear PTSD we think like soldiers, firefighters, yeah. police officers, paramedics but crisis counselors have a huge role and very aware of being susceptible to PTSD as well. Absolutely. We, we attend scenes sometimes with yeah. officers, whether it's a traffic fatality or a sudden death or right. a homicide. Uh, and often we have to read reports throughout the day. Right. Um, so we're getting, I guess, the narrative form of a traumatic incident. And so that tells its own story that files away in the mind. Yeah, for yeah. sure. If you had one message for first responders who are maybe starting or in the middle of a journey mm -hmm. uh, in recovery, what would that be? I think it would be having honest check-ins with yourself right. uh, and having that space to do that. So often, you know, some, you see someone during the day and they say, hey, how are you doing? And then before you could say how you're doing, they're already gone, right? right. Um, but taking a practice of just sitting and taking a couple deep breaths in and saying, how am I feeling today? Um, what do I need to be well today? And asking yourself those two questions. So how am I feeling? What do I need to be well? Right. And being well doesn't mean that I'm in a state of unwellness, but what do I need to feel replenished? Mm -hmm. It's a really important question to ask ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting how a lot of people, if you say, how are you doing? They go, oh, I'm fine. Yeah. Or, I'm good. And they, you know, how often is that casual response to that question yeah. when there should be, there's something deeper there for sure yeah. all of the time. Absolutely. Whether it's good or bad, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So other than that, um, you know, uh, speaking of uh, stigma, uh, over the years, have, how has stigma, have you seen stigma change with the whole PTSD? You know, there used to be years ago, it used to be, well, I'm man enough or I'm, I'm woman enough, I can yeah. push this to the side. Has, yeah. has that uh, changed at all in your time? I don't know. I, I think that society is becoming more open to saying that this is what I'm experiencing. Like individuals feel a bit more a bit more safe to say this is yeah. how I'm feeling. Uh, I think it's becoming more of a discussion in the workplace Good. of being honest about this is what I'm experiencing as I go out to support other people right. uh, and this is what I'm taking and this is what I'm, my body and my mind are holding on to. Uh, so I feel like the conversation's opening up Good. more and opportunities like this and this conference give um, an opportunity for the discussion to continue on. Absolutely, it's a very important part to have those talks like you've mentioned for sure. Well thank you so much for your time Rainy May. Thank you very much. Here now with Doug Flute, the retired police officer and current instructor at the Ontario Police College. You're a leadership instructor, right? Yeah, leadership studies, and uh, that involves frontline leadership through sergeants, uh, all the 911 communications supervisors, uh, community policing, yeah. and um, the other one I'm doing is media. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow, so you really have a whole breadth of the leadership roles that a, a police officer could have throughout their career. Yeah, I've had an, an incredible career with the Guelph Police Service. I served 28 years. Uh, it was a fantastic opportunity. Uh, it gave me a really neat platform or soapbox, so to speak, to actually stand up, be a positive male role model in the community, but also help the community, and, and specifically the youth. Uh, I've always wanted to be that stand-up person that young people could look up to and go, I want to be like that guy one time. And, uh, you know, th those efforts were quite noble, but I didn't do it for a personal gratification, but just to stand up there and show that men can be very loving, caring people in our community, right. and they can show young men what it's like to be a man. It's not about uh, some of the, the, the what TV portrays men to be. Right. It's more of a, a cerebral side of it, or even just an emotional side that you know men can cry, men can be compassionate, men can be empathetic. It's not that the whole testosterone-fueled visions right. of a man. It's about being a complete man. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your childhood. Then you mentioned your mom. Yep. Uh, I've got my mom and my dad. Um, we grew up. Uh, 
uh, and I was born in Stratford. Um, unfortunately, two weeks, two, two to three days into my life, um, my parents found out that I had a, a very bad uh, medical condition. Mm -hmm. The doctors brought me in and said, uh, basically, say goodbye to your little boy. We're going to try some exploratory surgery on him, see if we can make him alive. Uh, to this day, I still have a 23-stitch scar that you know goes basically from my breastplate down to my belly button. Wow. They did a surgery, and luckily, I survived. Uh, within another two years, they were called back in. I was breaking out in bruises and that type of stuff, and uh, they said, say goodbye to your little boy again because he's got some type of a rare form of blood disease that we don't know. And uh, for a second time, my parents had to say goodbye. Uh, they gave me some experimental drugs. Boom, by the grace of God, or, and I'm a Christian, and, and yeah. you know, I, I honestly believe that I was saved at those times. Uh, when I was four or five years of age, um, the doctor said I was miraculously cleared. Wow. And uh, in later years, my dad said that at that time, it was extremely uh, very uh, trying on him and my mom. He's actually upstairs right now. He came with me to the conference. But he just said, you know, I went to the doctor and said, that little sucker isn't going to die. He must have a purpose <laughs> in life. For sure. Well, you found that purpose, obviously. I think I have, and you know, I've always taken uh, the opportunities that I've had. Um, I don't look as roadblocks, but I look at them as hurdles. And, and too many times in life, people see a roadblock and they stop. You know, that caution, yellow tape. Well, we can't go beyond there. And you know, with obviously safety and common sense, I've always used them as a hurdle. And I thought, if I can live my life to the best of my ability, yeah. then hopefully, maybe someday, I can uh, touch someone in a positive way. And I know after the 28 years when I retired, I received some incredible. Uh, uh, comments and letters and it, it just made me really feel good at that the efforts that I so so diligently and so passionately worked towards right. came to came to make people's lives better so my mom who's five foot tall I'm six one two forty oh, wow. uh, ex-university football player and you got yeah. this little mom at five feet tall going hey you know <laughs> I, I'm glad that uh, the goals that she and my father set for me I, I wanted to make them proud and, I, and I'm in my heart of hearts I know that I've met those goals absolutely that's wonderful yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you mentioned you're working a lot with the youth is yeah. there a reason like a driving force behind that? Why you wanted to work so much with youth? When I grew up, um, I had a, a grade 8 teacher. Um, I was one of those kids that grew this way before I grew that way. Right. And I remember going into grade 7 uh, phys ed class. You know, when you're 13, 14 years of age, you're very insecure about your body as, as yeah, it is. Absolutely. You're going through changes. you got hair in your armpits and all this type of stuff. Your voice starts to change. We just thought it was funny that you would call me Fatty Fluke. Oh. And my last name is Flug, so Fatty Flug was this great thing. So I kept that from grade seven, eight, and nine. And I just remembered how, you know, as a, as a male a phys ed teacher, he had failed me. And I thought, you know, I will not be like that. And from a very young age, everyone that used to say, well, my parents used to say to me, see, when you see something you like, duplicate it and make it better. And when right. you see something you don't like, do the opposite. So, so, you know, and, and with that, I've tried to do my whole career that way, whether it was as a coach, whether it was a mentor, whether it was a police officer. So I, I just saw so many areas where I was failed. But in grade nine or grade 10, actually, I met Mr. John Cater and God rest his soul, he's passed away several years ago. He was my high school football coach that I didn't play sports in grade nine. And the neat thing was, is he saw me in phys ed and he thought, you know, this kid's got some good hands, he can catch a football. Right. He started to develop that talent and he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Okay. And he gave me the gift of basically putting me on a journey that brought me to be where I am today. Wow. And uh, when I turned 40, 11 years ago, <laughs> I actually had the wonderful opportunity. I, I called him back and I said, Mr. Cater, uh, I know, you know, when we talked and everything and I said, uh, he said he was very proud of me. I said, that's all because of you. And he's like, but Flug, yeah, he really didn't do much. Right. But the very fact that with that humility that he had, I thought, you know, and it reinforced that I want to be that guy. I want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Give young men an opportunity to grow. And it's, it's like a seed. You know, we all have that seed. And if you plant it and it doesn't get the nourishment it needs, it doesn't grow into that big, powerful tree. Right. And, and I thought, if I have that opportunity through coaching or mentorship or what have you, that I can help some young men live a really good life down the road, that's what life's all about is it's about paying our service to others. So uh, I, I looked at specifically young men because, unfortunately, Unfortunately, men have ruined the world in a lot of ways. Uh, when you look statistically with the domestic violence and such, there's a lot of situations where men have ruined the world. I wanted to be on the flip side, do the opposite like my mom and dad said, right. and be one of those men that tries to make a real change. Oh, wow. That's an amazing story. Yeah. Wow. That one teacher and your parents, of yeah. course, two driving forces behind putting you on that path. Yeah. And it's incredible. And, and um, last year I was honored by Mayor Cam Guthrie of Guelph that yeah. uh, I got a, uh, a mayor's award. And at the end of the, the presentation, they told me I had two minutes for the acceptance speech. And as you're going to find tonight, I can't do anything in two minutes. <laughs> yes. And uh, I told Cam that I wanted to thank all the people who had stepped up and been really positive in my life to the point that I thought that this was award was about them. Right. So I was allowed to share that. But at the end of the award, and it is on YouTube if you want to take a look, I said, you know, as we leave tonight, you need to do a favor for me. And I would say this for your video as well. Um, you know, go out there and try to make a stranger smile. Or better yet, mentor a young person because you have right. no idea how that one small act of kindness can unleash some incredible human potential. And had Mr. Cater not done that, 
I don't know where I would have been. Yeah. But he saw something in me. He gave me a phenomenal supportive platform that he said, you're going to be good one day or, or I believe in you. Right. And, you know, just think of as we grow up in our lives. If someone says you're a piece of crap, you're going to believe that you're a piece of crap. Absolutely. But if someone says they believe in you, we don't hear those compliments about other people. But that amazing power of I believe in you Teach us someone to believe in themselves, that's spectacular. Right. And so you're dealing with a lot of, like, of the ripple effect then, right? Yeah. Whereas like you hold the door open for one person, they hold it for, open for the next, the next, and it's somebody true. buys a coffee for somebody and it yeah. just snowballs. And it goes back to what mom said, make every person's life that you're involved with better because you were there, not worse. Right, absolutely, wow. So what has community service meant to you in regards to post-traumatic stress disorder then? I think for me, um, I'm so glad that I had that opportunity. Uh, community service has saved my life right. um, on multiple occasions. Um, and, and for me, I look at it that I've given of myself in honesty, integrity, passion, accountability of the community. And you know, when I've been at my lowest of my low, it's actually saved my life. And, and I look uh, most recently, something very, ha tra very trying happened about uh, six, seven months ago. The next day, my wife and I were doing it. She's a police officer as well. And we were working with the Peel Regional Police because they hosted the Summer Games for Special Olympics. Yeah. And it was such an incredible experience that we felt bad. If one of our family members had done something really stupid that really hurt us personally. So that was the Friday. The next day we went to the Special Olympics. We're sitting there setting up for the soccer venue and we see one of the Special Olympians across the field looking at us, smiling, you know, doing some silly kicks, pointing at us. And I remember looking over my shoulder going, is he talking to me? He's like, you, yeah, smile, smile. And uh, you know, I just thought, this is very odd because you know, I've been doing Special Olympics for about 15 years. It's my charity of choice, it's my passion of choice. So I left that venue because I was the MC for Bocce. So I'm sitting at Bocce and this gentleman walks over and his name was Matthew. He's one of the athletes and he goes, hi, my name is Matthew. You look really sad. I said, well, I, I, what are you talking about? He goes, you've got really sad eyes. He goes, you need a hug. And he gave me a hug. Right. Well, I had tears in my eyes thinking, what the heck's going on here? And uh, I said, Matthew, thank you so much for introducing me. Uh, actually, now when I do the bocce ball, I'm going to talk to you. And I, can I mention your name? Sure, no problem. Right. So then we went to the, uh, the closing ceremonies and another little guy, Michael, walks over. And Michael had Down syndrome. He had a beautiful pink dress shirt on. He had this nice plaid tie. He says, you have a sad heart right now. I want to give you a hug and you're going to be my new best friend. So he gave me that, the hug, the best friend. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> We're done that, and my wife and I are looking like this is just too coincidental. Yeah, then I go to the bathroom and I run it. We run into the soccer player, and he had his medal, and we had a big picture and a hug. He said, "You know, from across the side of the field, he said, I could see you're a good man, but you were hurting, and I wanted to make you laugh because I knew you were having a rough time." Oh, geez. And I turned to my wife, Michelle, and I said, you know, do not tell me that God does not exist right. because so many people look for these big, grand miracles. We had three miracles in one day. Wow. So community service, because we do it for the right reasons and we just yeah. give of ourselves, at our lowest of our low, when we needed the, the most help in the world and the most motivation personally, bam, three little miracles or three little angels came in to help our lives. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And they just lifted you up and then you were able yeah. to carry through and... We did and you know, for me, at the times that I find that I feel worse about myself through the PTSD that we're suffering from, I tend to over medicate with community service. I put myself in positions, and sometimes too much, <laughs> but I put myself in positions where I feel good because people want me in their lives. You know, you go and you coach sports or you, you mentor young people, people are so happy, but when you feel really cruddy about yourself, if you've got the opportunity to go and do some community service work and do it for the right reasons, those reasons are going to come back and right. it's, it's like the investment. You put money in the bank, you get interest back. Yeah. When you do these things in community service, you know, you're helping other people for the right reason. You just never know when you, you know, you're going to have that down day. But when you, whenever we go to Special Olympics or, 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 or anything else, hey, Mr. Flug, how are you? You get the big hug. Those are the million dollar hugs that you can't buy. Oh, absolutely. And it, do, it, it does save my life. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And so that's how you would ha you handle your PTSD. It's so interesting because the people we've talked to handle it in different ways, yeah. right? So that's one way that you're doing it to, to help yeah. with yourself. The big piece with it though, I know at, there was about seven years ago, I was the lowest of the low and I was coaching the Gulf Storm my daughter's soccer, both university football or university soccer teams. I was a mentor with the Griffin football team and I was coaching the, the wrestling team. Oh, wow. I honestly think I, I, community service, it, it's like anything. Everything's good in moderation. Mm -hmm. But I think indirectly I was feeling so low and so terrible about myself because I hadn't got the counseling yet that I needed. Right. That, you know, not that I was trying to kill myself, but I think I was trying to put myself in a position where I'd fail because I did too much. So it's like, you know, whatever you do to help yourself, make sure it's in moderation and don't let something that's supposed to be enjoyable become uh, an obsession and, yeah. and that's one thing that I really caution that I love the fact that I had those opportunities but I, I got to a point where I really had to check and balance and pull myself back because I was overextending myself right. where I physically got 
stressed and you know the, the pain that I was feeling mentally started to come from the source that was supposed to be the solution oh, you know, through yeah. community service so I became a conflict and after that point I started I called the AP at work and uh, it was just it was euphoric where we came from from there well wow. how do you feel physical exercise plays into uh, dealing with this post-traumatic stress disorder then F uh, for me uh, it's somewhere it's when you're in my PTSD from calls for service and and I think specifically of two through my career uh, back in 1991 ish uh, it was Devil's Night, uh, so we're looking at October the 30th. Just started my shift, working five to three. We get a call that there's uh, someone's being silly and they threw a mannequin in the leaves. And in Guelph, what happens is everyone takes their leaves, they put it in the gutter, then the elephant truck comes by. Okay. When I got there, there was a dead 12-year-old little boy because he was playing in the leaves. Someone drove over top of him. I remember being there, and I was devastated because I always wanted to be a dad. I've got two amazing daughters, but you know, I'm, I was 23, 24 years of age. Life just hadn't got me to that path. And I remember picking his little body up and putting him on the stretcher and one of the veterans was laughing at me because I was crying and uh, you know come on suck it up you're this big university football player and you know come on suck it up it's just a dead year old 12 year old kid that was their coping mechanism right. which was wrong but that was the old world yeah but I was I had such sore on my heart but we didn't have infrastructure in place for you know critical incident stress management we didn't have any debriefs we didn't have EAP so that to this day I still have never really fully dealt with I still kind of have shadows of that in my mind fast forward to about seven years ago we had a call for service where a baby had drowned she was 18 months old my daughter was like 22 months old at the oh, same time man. and what I found is that um, you know I'm holding her little body trying to do CPR and go back to mom make everyone's life better because you're coming to it worse and I personally felt that I failed and I really crashed after that because I saw my what my actions were as a failure and right. because I couldn't I couldn't bring this little girl back to life right, right. but that wasn't in the cards and I remember I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't eating but I was still working out because in the situations that were going on I had no control but when I was working out I had control right okay. I could go in there and the only thing I had to deal with was the weight yeah. but my efforts were noble and, and I could go in there and it, it got me working out has got me through a lot of very stressful situations where you the world just dumps on you and you have no control but that's where I, I kind of refound myself because as a, as a university athlete that's where I went from my happy place to oh, okay. build on yeah. you know and uh, becoming a police officer all of those things were a direct result because I found myself in the gym and I was working out make myself stronger faster fitter which is my motto for my personal training and I, it's where I kind of went back to my center right. and, and I was able to go back to where the world was at our oyster you know you're 20 years of age you're in university you're doing your studies you're just about to start your life yeah. and go, working out for me has been one it's been a physical release so you can get rid of all that negative energy in you so that once you're physically exhausted I find then I can really talk right. or it could take me back to that happy place and uh, with baby Emily um, it was amazing because I, uh, I actually called her grandmother up and I wanted her to know that I didn't fail and uh, or I, I tried my best right. and it was really neat because I needed something and I actually provided her something which kind of blew me away and she said thank you so much for calling because I was crying on the other line and I won't deny that and she said you know we always wondered who held our little girl before she went up to God and I was just like whoa you know and it kind of freaked me out I needed some answers and I needed some consolation but in the end she's like it's so nice to know that she was in loving arms oh, wow. and so I reached out and then she would reach back and it was just like wow and then I went and I had a great workout <laughs> to get rid of the negative yeah. and that's one thing I always say it's almost uh, it's like a Pandora's box when you have bad things happen throw it in your brain you know keep it there you know you know, sometimes you can't deal with things, but then you go to the gym, you take one of those pieces out, you remember how angry or how frustrated or how just boggled up it made you. You take that, you use to fuel your workout, you do your workout, your cardio, whatever you do, you take that negative attack on you, you get rid of all that negative energy and you feel great after a workout. Right. So that negative attack that comes in is almost like a boomerang and then you throw positive back out. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So that, that's what I've done. That, community service and working out have been my salvations, yeah. along with some really good counseling through the uh, employee assistance program that the Guelph Police had and uh, I thank them I can't thank them enough because had I not had that um, the support. therapeutic support yeah. I don't know that I'd be here today oh. so that hopefully in this conference I can help people just with my story and, and when I talk tomorrow this isn't me telling anyone what to do I, I would never disrespect people's pain by that way yeah. but if I can talk to them about my community service my faith or, or the fact that I'm working out and that's how I combat it mm -hmm. th those types of things maybe if that gives them that little bit of a light then I've done my job yeah absolutely you can break that stigma down right yeah. that you're like you know what I, I was there I felt yeah. it and this is how I'm dealing with it you may deal with it differently yeah. but yeah. I wanted to let you know it's okay. 
Yeah, and in law enforcement, uh, they, when we're training younger officers, we talk about inoculating them with stress. We tell them that you're going to go into these crisis situations, and this is what to expect. Mm -hmm. So that you know, and, and even with the EAP, when they said you're going to have night sweats, you're going to wake up and not have, you're going to have bad dreams. So that when I woke up with night sweats or I woke up with the bad dreams, ah, I should have expected this, as opposed to what's wrong with me. Right. So it, it, that's the one thing that, you know, with EAP, that's now, it's, it's we, we, with the younger officers, we tell them, you're going to hurt. It's okay. You're going to have these symptoms. It's okay. You're not a freak. You're not bad. This is just your body's way of dealing with things. But don't just leave it at that. Get that formalized help that you need so they can ask the right questions so that they can open up those boxes of pain inside of you and bring it out in a very loving, caring, uh, therapeutic environment. Right, in a way that they can let it go and, and deal yeah. with it in their own way. Yeah. yeah, productively. Interesting. Wow. You know, you and your wife, you're both police officers. Yeah. Does this help build the relationship? Can you feed off each other? You know what you're both going yeah. through, obviously. Yeah. I was married before, and I do, uh, part of the ownership there is you'd come home and you had a really cruddy day. Right. And you know, you'd, well tell me about your day. So you'd start down here, and you'd start telling about your day, tell me about your day, tell me you're getting tired, you're getting tired, you're getting tired. <laughs> and you get to the point that you won't understand. You know, and again, that's one thing law enforcement, any police fire ambulance has to realize that our significant others are there to help us. Yeah. And they want to help us, mm -hmm. but we have to tell them how to help us. Right. And if you don't do that, you find that you shut them out and then you go talk to your buddies more and, and then you disconnect from your, your partner in life and, and that's wrong. Yeah. And I look with Michelle and I, she'll, she's an IDENT officer or CSI as people talk on TV. So she'll come out and say, I just processed a murder scene where a child was killed. I can go right there. And instead of starting down here with her, we can talk right here. And that's where we need the help. And that's where it's really neat between us because we, we have those reference points in our minds. So if I say I had a bad day because, she can go, oh yeah, I'm right there. <laughs> right. But, but once we start talking, after about 10 minutes, we've got a rule, which is kind of cool. And uh, she'll be like, okay, do you want to just bitch or do you want me to help you? Because sometimes we just want to bitch. And the worst thing that I can do is if she just wants to bitch and I start to give her solutions because I can become part of the chaos she's talking about when she just wants me to be there and be that wall so she can just throw the stuff off. And so that's one thing that we do tremendous. We've been together seven years now. Yeah. And, and again, we'll come home. Do you want to just bitch? Yeah, okay, then bitch away. <laughs> then the, the, and again, it's what I said earlier. Your spouse loves you, wants to help you. But yeah. you've got to tell them the rules. Yeah. If you don't tell them what you need, they're going to just try to do whatever they can and do too much when if you just want to be, you know, I just want you to bitch, you know, and listen, or I need you to help me solve this. Yeah. And then that way they can throw a different hat on and then they can help you. And then together you solve it together and then you become closer as a couple. And that whole thing where, you know, in, in previous lives where you'd go out there and you might go to your best buddies to talk over a beer. Now your best buddy is your spouse, yeah. so it makes that relationship even better. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can relate with that totally because yeah. I used to be the problem solver. Yeah. My wife would start talking to me like, yeah. "How can I help you? Do you need this? Do you know about that?" Yeah. She's like, "No, I just want you to listen." Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, the other thing we do for success is because we work shift work, right. um, we never end the date we're on till we plan the next date. Oh, nice. And, and I, I give that advice to a lot of young officers because it's very overwhelming with the shift schedules. Yeah. I was working a, a three-week rotation. She works a four-week rotation. So there's a period there where we would go seven days where we wouldn't even see each other. And when we have those days, it really sucks. It does yeah. because we're such best friends. But when we make the date that uh, in, in next week we're going to do this, it helps you get through those down times right. because you know you're going to see your best friend. Yeah, something you look forward yeah. to. Yeah, but it, it also, it, it's nice because you can remember that you do have someone supporting you and you know it's it gives you accountability and, and think of yourself how many couples do you know that say you know we haven't seen you well let's get together next week right well six months later next week never happened you know and in two busy schedules it's going to happen because we're planning for it and it helps us get through those times when we can't see each other yeah wow well thank you so much doug for sharing your personal stories it's much appreciated yeah, and, and opening up for this uh, documentary and let's hope we uh, we help someone you know and that's at the end of the day i commend you for what you're doing because uh this is a subject that 15 years ago no one talked about right. and now people are talking about it and it's so nice to see a lot of our public figures a lot of our professional athletes where people look up to them yeah. and if they see that everyone's human maybe they themselves will be human and realize that it's okay to ask for help. Absolutely, thank you, Doug. Thank you very much. Yes. Awesome. awesome.
Now here with Brian Stevens, a, a career, well, you had 17 years as a paramedic. Could yes, you just start, Brian, talking about your career as a paramedic and the paramedic services? Yeah, yeah I worked uh, 13 years in uh, the city of Mississauga and Etobicoke, uh, back and forth, as a uh, basic life support paramedic and uh, an advanced uh, life support medic. Um, great career, right. outstanding people to, uh, to work with. and. Uh, Came down to uh, the end of 13 years and decided I needed a change. Um, and uh, the opportunity came for me to move into the air ambulance operation. I was already doing uh, uh, a little bit of air ambulance work. Um, I was working on a, uh, a Learjet, wow. uh, yeah, for a company, uh, Sky Service Lifeguard. And I was flying around the world on a Learjet, wow. uh, bringing uh, people home that had been uh, sick and injured while they're away on vacation or just traveling. Um, but when the opportunity came for me to uh, to jump into uh, working for uh, uh, the service here in Ontario, uh, the opportunity was uh, was outstanding, and I uh, I moved into the uh, the career uh, 17 years ago, and uh, just an outstanding critical care flight career. Right. So that was is that the orange helicopter? <coughs> yeah, that's oh, orange. Yeah. yeah, that's the orange helicopter. I worked uh, mainly uh, about 90 percent of my career. I worked out of the uh, out of London, Ontario. Okay. Uh, but I did do about a year, maybe a little bit more than a year, uh, sabbatical back and forth between our Toronto Island base and uh, and London. For those years then, working in those positions, you've probably seen a multitude of, of things wow. over the years. Yeah. We, uh, you know, our mandate in, in the air ambulance service is to uh, treat and transport the most critically ill people yeah. uh, and the most uh, highest level of trauma that you can uh, you can see out there. Um, you know, we, we uh, in, in the air ambulance program, Program, we were able to to bypass local hospitals and go right straight to trauma centers obviously with how quick we can travel um, so we were called out uh, <clears throat> all the time days and nights uh, just for that aspect that people that were so severely traumatized that taking them to local hospitals only delayed their uh, their treatment process so right. yeah so then tell me about Frontline Forward. What is that, the organization you started? That? Yeah, Frontline Forward, uh, since I've, uh, I'd, I've been off the aircraft, um, I got diagnosed with PTSD back in right. August of 2014. Right. And uh, while I was going through my, uh, my treatment uh, therapy uh, sessions, I just noticed that there was a... Uh, there was just a void missing from, um, you know, uh, from our frontline staff and, and our first responders and, and what was out there for us as far as uh, treatment. So I came up with the idea along with a couple other friends. I, I brought the, the, uh, the business concept to them. Uh, they thought it was outstanding and we decided to, to move forward with this. So uh, we're going to be opening in uh, January or February of next year. Wow. And it's a uh, multidisciplinary uh, PTSD and OSI Wellness and Treatment Center oh, wow. focused on helping frontline staff and first responders, but our doors are open to absolutely everybody and anybody. Wow. So yeah. What, talk about the facility then. Is this going to be all, like what is going to be in the facility? Yeah, so the facility, uh, it, it's quite a large place. It's a uh, 8,200 square feet oh, wow. uh, facility. Yeah, so we have a, a 4,000 square foot fully functional gym with training staff, all geared, all, all my training staff are either firefighters, police officers, Officers or paramedics or corrections officers. Okay. So um, fully functional gym. Um, we also have a 1,200 square foot yoga meditation studio, uh, and I have offices uh, which are going to house uh, two psychologists, um, a fascial stretching therapist, uh, physiotherapist, and massage therapy. Wow, that's yeah. so interesting. You have the yoga and the gym, like because we've been talking in the documentary to uh, Doug uh, and Randy May, and Randy May was talking about mindfulness, mm -hmm. and Doug was talking about using exercise to deal with his PTSD. Mm -hmm. So you've got both there. So you've got both angles covered. That's yeah, about, yeah. Our, our whole focus was to really bring in a, 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 a sort of one-stop shop uh, center uh, to treat the mind, body, and soul. Yeah. And, and that's what we're, we're really, because, uh, you know, from my aspect, I know that physical fitness was such a big part of what kept me in my career. Yeah. Uh, but uh, coming to understand all about yoga and meditation and how beneficial, beneficial that is also to, uh, to your mindfulness. So I take in the whole physical fitness and the mind stuff and combine that into, into one, uh, one incredible center. It's, it's truly a unique and innovative place that uh, I hope that's 
going to reach out and be able to, uh, to help a number of people. Oh, wow. So where would the center be located then? Uh, we're in Kitchener, Ontario. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're on uh, 45 Shirley Avenue. Brand, it's, a, it's an older building, uh, but we're making it look brand new again. Excellent. Yeah. So if people want more information about uh, this organization, Frontline Forward, where could they go? Yeah, uh, our Facebook page is up okay. and running, uh, Frontline Forward. Um, we have a uh, video online, also on YouTube, that you can uh, just type in Frontline Forward and it'll okay. bring it up. Uh, you can also go to, uh, our website is just being developed right now, but if you just go to www.frontlineforward.com. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thank time. You. It was excellent, Brian, and thank looking you. forward to you getting this already and, and all the work you're going to do to help these people out with PTSD. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Here with Natalie Nokawak now, a registered social worker. And uh, Natalie, like first of all, your profession, what is a registered social worker do then? So social work is a pretty broad profession mm -hmm. in that social workers can work very much from grassroots and community organizations with poverty and people at disadvantages, um, work with children, youth, teens, adults, and then work all the way up to policy making at government levels, legal, hospitals, um, it's quite a, a wide range scope in social work yeah. of, uh, of what social workers do. And they're actually, social work is actually the largest mental health um, group of mental health workers in North America. So oh, there's wow. Yeah, there is a lot of social workers out there, and uh, yeah, so everything from community all the way up to clinical, so right. quite a range. And it's interesting too, because you, you know, when we say first line responders, we're always thinking like police, fire, ambulance, you know, doctors maybe even, uh, but social workers are quite front line too. We were just mentioning before we got started that you could be very front line. You can be very front line, particularly if you work you know, in hospitals, um, if you work for victim services, yeah. for example. So um, I'm in private practice now, but I have done, over the 20 years of social work that I've done so far, I have done community, I've done um, in schools, I've done in hospitals, I've done now private practice where I do the counseling, but part of that is with victim services. So I still am involved on a level with crises or through different employee assistance programs, parts of that work with trauma. So going into, for example, I worked in Godridge following the tornado. Oh wow. So that was very frontline work, yeah. going in the day after, putting my hard hat on, going into the salt mine, working with uh, the first responders there and doing some debriefing and, Wow. Yeah, so it can be very frontline. Yeah. Yeah. You almost need your own debriefing after something like that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and that's why that's why, you know, take you know, frontline workers need to take care of their mental health as well, to have a yeah. support network with other frontline workers or with supervisors, with their own counselors and so on. Yeah, so you're just kind of getting into that, but why is like counseling helpful for people in general? But yeah, I find it's helpful because although we can have some good friends or good family members or people to talk to, I find with counseling, well, number one, people are trained in it. So people know, you know, counselors who are good counselors and have experience will know the right questions to ask. And they'll also create a safe space for people to open up and talk. And they'll know, you know, the right things to say or work together with people on suggestions. So it's being trained in it. They can hold that space, they can handle it, they can keep it confidential, which is really, really necessary in the healing process. That right. Although we can get that sometimes outside of counseling, a lot of people I find say that they find that really helpful to have somebody more neutral, that they're not feeling like they're burdening someone right. or feel like they're you know, letting out family secrets or dealing with things that they might not want coworkers to know or might not always want family and friends to know all the details of a certain situation. So I think it's getting different perspectives, different strategies and having somebody who's, I guess, wanting to be there to do that and willing to be there to do that and having the techniques and the strategies and training to do so. Yeah, and you were mentioning like, uh, you know, it being neutral and like probably non-judgmental is a big thing too, where you kind of take in what they're saying and, and help them work through it, right? Instead of being, you know, judging, it, you know, too often we go to judging as just humanity. That's right, so. that's right. To be able to be vulnerable and open up yeah. very vulnerable things, it's necessary to have somebody 
in a healing way, it's necessary to have somebody who can really listen right. and not judge, right. to be able to hear the story and really hear and be able to, like I said, ask the right questions yeah. or look at the right ways to work through those, those yeah. difficult situations that we all go through in life. Yeah. So how could people find a counselor? And, and it's also finding the right counselor, right, for their, their, their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so social workers, as I was saying, are quite a broad network of different types of different types of social workers. Um, social workers cannot do uh, social workers can do assessments but not diagnosis. So if somebody's looking for say a mental health diagnosis, it would be a registered psychologist or a registered psychiatrist. And oftentimes for a registered um, psychiatrist they would need to go through their family doctor. Um, social workers, if they're looking for someone in private practice for a social worker or a registered psychologist or other types of counselors such as a marriage counselor or other types of counselors out there as well, usually through the family doctor they could ask. Um, there's um, word of mouth, asking people is a really good way, finding out from people they know, who they've been to see. Yeah. People sometimes look up on the internet. There's also on the internet the Ontario 211, oh, right. as well as you can call in 211 and find out what resources are in the area. So that's applicable in all of Ontario. So local newspapers, um, sometimes people still use the phone book. There's certain websites online such as Psychology Today or find a social worker. .ca that people can look up and read a little bit of a bio and okay. background. Yeah. But it's a good point that you make about finding not just a counselor, but finding the right one. Yeah. And sometimes that takes a little bit of patience and persistence in that if you don't connect right away with the counselor that you're seeing, you may want to try another one just to make sure. Because I really think it's the connection that's first of all the most important thing that you feel comfortable with the person that you're going to be vulnerable right. with and opening up about things and feel like you can talk and feel like you can have as well as opening up about your conversation about yeah. problems that you're able to connect with the person and talk about life in general or feel comfortable so sometimes it does happen that right away you connect with a counselor yeah. and other times it might take exploring a little bit and finding out what style of counselor works best for you or what type of therapy that they might use that works best for what you're dealing with. Right. So don't be deterred if you go to, if you, you get to that point, which is sometimes very hard to do, where you think, I need a counselor, mm -hmm. and then to get a counselor that's not working, don't be deterred right away. Maybe try that's a right. different counselor. That's right. And it's not that anything's wrong with you if you go and feel like you didn't connect. It just might be that, that it wasn't the right fit. Right. and that you might need a different approach or a different style to help you feel comfortable. So absolutely not to be deterred yeah. right away. Yeah, because I find that sometimes that can be the big thing if somebody's finally gotten to that point where they want to take the counseling. And I'm not saying that the counselor is doing anything wrong. Like you said, they just not, something's not working. They're not meeting. So, you know, not being discouraged right away from that That's first right. opportunity try at it. That's right. And I'll often say to people in a first session, uh, because I'm in private practice, I do the counseling. I will often say to people when they're setting up a first session, I will say, come for a first session and let's see if there's a connection. Let's make sure it's the right fit of services for you. And if it is, we can look at continuing and, you know, make a plan around that. And right. if not, you don't have to feel like you're hurting my feelings. I will be here to help you connect with other resources. And nice. you know, even if I can do that to help the person just be honest and say, yeah, I think this is more what I'm looking for and I can help guide them to somebody else or. Right, that's, that's very nice because if somebody's finally at that point where they're going to a counselor, they're probably in a very vulnerable position. So you, sure, you want to let sure. them know that it's okay if and they want to okay. disconnect and Absolutely. go to somebody else. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so uh, what kind of uh, different types of coverage people may have uh, available for counseling? Like what, what's available out there? So for, in general, everyone's covered um, under OHIP. Okay. So certain resources are free in the community. So oftentimes through the family health team, right. through a family doctor, or through the Canadian Mental Health Association, those are examples of free resources. In some places, they'll have uh, family services available to people. So there are free resources. And again, people can find it through their family doctor, mm -hmm. through word of mouth, searching online, or the 211. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people who are working will have benefits for 
counseling specifically. So that's like their extended health benefits that would cover dental and you know going for a massage or chiropractor. Oftentimes under that coverage there will be a clause as well for counseling. Right, so that's mostly like the employee assistant programs that you're talking about. Yeah, there's also, so there is also employee assistance program okay. which is similar but separate. So oh, okay. people's um, extended health coverage would be private benefits that when you go to seek somebody in private practice, for example, you would pay a fee mm -hmm. and then submit the invoice to your insurance company and get reimbursed for it. So people often will have through a workplace as well the employee assistance program or employee family assistance program they sometimes people will call it EAP or EFAP okay. and so that's a separate type of coverage that a company will purchase so there are various different types of EAP or EFAP companies that work with your workplace right. and set up packages for employees so that say for example the employee and their family members will have access to a 1-800 number that they can call for yeah. counseling sometimes there's financial service legal service different types of health and wellness services under the EAP so that's another way to get into counseling is to call a person's EAP or a family member's EAP request for the counseling service right. and and um, they'll do an intake with you at that point and try to connect you with a counselor that they feel best fits what you're looking for. Right. So to find out about that, you probably would just say uh, that people recommend to go and talk to like their HR department, for example, their at their department. work and see what they have available or talk to their family doctor and get a, a referral that way as That's well. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Good. So what are some of the most common issues you see people for for counseling then? I would say one of the most common issues would be anxiety right. across the board because I work with children, teens, adults. Right. Anxiety is a very, very common one. Anxiety, depression, um, relationship issues, especially with conflict uh, with couples and yeah. working through relationships or conflict within family and working through ways to communicate or ways to resolve conflict or to feel more comfortable in conflict. Um, trauma is definitely um, a major issue that people come for different types of traumas whether it's accidents or violence or something that they've gone through in the past. Um, so I, I work with a range from sometimes with war vets, with uh, police officers, paramedics, firefighters, nurses, um, and then just people in, in general. Like I'm, I'm mentioning about the frontline workers that come, sometimes yeah. it's trauma, sometimes it's relationship issues and so on. Um, so yeah, I would say those are some of the main issues that I, I see most often in, in counseling. Okay. What's, what's the most positive part of your work then? Like what do you, what do you get out of it as a positivity? So I would say I'm very lucky and blessed that I love my job yeah. and I've loved it for the entire 20 years that I've been doing it, the right. variety of it. The thing I think that I like the most about it is the connection with people mm -hmm. that I have day to day and hour by hour when I see people that people are able to come in and open and share their stories and to see people working through some of their issues and resolving some of their issues and when people are able to come back and say that they're doing so much better, feeling so much better, or have learned ways to cope, yeah. because life will happen. Right. So I would say that's one of the most positive parts is the connection with people. And because I love people, I love that connection and, and love that part of my job the most. Awesome. Yeah. And I guess the big thing there, if you see the stigma breaking down, where people mm -hmm. can, are finally over that hump of, well, I can talk about it now, right? Yeah, and I've seen that progress over the years. So I've been in private practice for seven years now. Okay. And I would say even in that seven years, I've seen I've seen it getting better and better. So when I first started, I would have the occasional people who would call and say, you know, I thought I could do it on my own and you know, I didn't want to have to call a counselor, almost feeling like it's a failure to have to call a counselor. Yeah. And sometimes wanting to come in the back door or park a block down and walk so people wouldn't see their cars there. Right. And I find that shifting and changing over time. I don't really get so many calls like that or I, I have people who just don't mind to park in front, come in, people who are fine with coming for counseling, they're fine with telling their friends and family that they're coming for counseling and that they see it as not a failure on their part yeah. but as a strength to reach out. So I oh, think so nice. I think it's coming with publicity about mental health and yes. reaching out for help. I th I really think it's helping okay. because I've seen it over the years improve. Good.
Yeah, that's really nice because that's one thing we're trying to do with this program is just to let people know there's resources out there and you can get help and don't feel like you need to like close the curtains in your house and shut the door and deal with it yourself. That's right. And I think the other thing too, going back to that question about finding a counselor, I think another benefit just to mention kind of connected to that is that life happens so if you go for counseling around a certain issue that you're dealing with right now and it's more resolved and um, I always let the person coming decide when when they feel like it's time to stop coming or right. sort of reduce the number of times that they come and sort of on their own be able to handle it but I find a lot of people will come back when another issue comes up in their life so right. life happens and I think it's such a great a great, I guess, tool to have or a great connection to have a counselor that you connect with that even if that issue is resolved that you're working on, that later on if something happens that you have that person to call. You already know, they know your background, they know who you right. are, so it's much easier to come in at that point. So I have that happen quite often that people will come in, they'll resolve some things, I won't see them for a little while and then they'll call and say, this happened, can I come back in and see you? And you know, it could be a death in the family or an accident yeah. or an issue with their child or something that's come up that they feel comfortable to reach out at that point and be able to work on another issue wouldn't that be, happens. Yeah, wouldn't it be great we get to the point where we always say, oh, I have my mechanic, I have my banker, that's right. I have this, I have my counselor. She's that's young. right, that's it's right, absolutely. They have my, I have my family doctor, I have my dentist, yeah, I have my counselor, doctor. I have my eye doctor, my mechanic, exactly. exactly. It would be it would be wonderful, and it is wonderful, and people are starting to do that more. Oh, good. They are starting to do that more and more. Yeah, and that's when we really know the stigma is starting to, to break down, which is the important part to that's let right. people talk about it. Well, thank you so much for your time, yeah. Natalie. Thank you. I'm here now with Nick Holmesy. Uh, you're an advocate, Nick, for uh, first mental health of first responders, and you also have this organization called After the Call. Uh, so let's start with like, wh what is After the Call? Where did that come from? Yeah, so I spent 10 years in the first responder field. So I was a, a part-time paid on-call firefighter. Um, After the Call came about uh, in kind of a cross section of my life. So I was just about to attend school to become. Uh, to get my paramedics license and, and tried for full time. I uh, landed in an intro psych course um, while still being at the fire mm -hmm. um, and loved it and kind of took off from there. So I ended up getting my degree and then my master's degree and at that same time noticing that there was no real support um, for bad calls. So um, one of the first ones I've talked about and written about extensively was kind of a train versus person. Um, and that moment where I recognized that not only did you leave that, but then you go on to just run other calls. Uh, there was there was no talk about it. There was no conversations about it. There was no, you know, you might have a few nights of sleeplessness. You might see this again, and that's normal kind of talks about it. So uh, I just married the two things that I loved it was you know the fire and first responder world and my you know the the knowledge and education that I got to to bring them together, create after the call. Uh, the whole premise behind it was that everything was paid, you know, you had to buy it all, right? So after the call is free mental health resources yeah, for first right. responders. So um, all the articles, everything I produce, uh, I offer on my website for free. You just go on, click it, take it, make it your own. Um, I ask people to reach out if they need things that are missing or those gaps are missing, I'll do the research and I'll, and I'll hunt it down and I'll create something for them. Wow. Um, and that's all available online. Wow. So that's kind of where I came from. It is, is my idea and philosophy between behind the, the you know these folks are coming out and in putting themselves in danger. Yeah, they chose to do that, and that's the roar. They did, but they didn't choose to go to those calls that they go to. They didn't choose to see the things that they see. Um, so you know, let's not make a profit margin off it. Let's let's try to get them some help for um, you know at least right off the inset uh, the inception, right off the beginning. Wow. Get them some support. That's amazing, Nick. Wow, that's. Awesome. Awesome. So the book then, where did that book the f that you wrote for first responders, mm -hmm. also called After the Call, it's yeah. a little bit of a longer title, yeah. but After the Call. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the book is actually uh, an amalgamation of my thesis that I finished for my schooling. Okay. Um, and I kind of just cut out all the boring stuff and made it a, a practical guide. Um, so a, a friend of mine always says that awareness means that somebody else has to do the work. So I hide actual practical skills behind a book that has awareness in the titles so that people it up um, but in it, it it talks about you know how to talk 
to you know at least your family, how to listen to at least your family, uh, the myths that we're hearing, and uh, you know what to do about it. Uh, so it's you know short, it's small, it's got pictures. It's it's just great for this uh, demographic, I think. Right, and it could probably would be a good book for um, a family member of a first responder to read too, so they get that sort of that inside knowledge that they can help that their yeah, family member with. Well, and the majority of uh, first responders that go to get help are anyways because they're getting the boot from the spouse at home, right? So that's it. They, when I do talks or anything like that, I, I, I ask that the departments invite spouses um, because they're their eyes and ears. You know, I say, how, do you, how does a fish know it's underwater? You got to first pull it out, right, before it realizes it lives underwater. Right. And so when we're in it and living it, we don't might we might not notice it. We might notice that we're off, but we still feel like us. Where our spouses are like, no, you're you're not, you're irri irritable. You're not sleeping. You're you're drinking too much. You're doing all of these things. You need to get help, right? So it's having those conversations open and early, so that you're getting the support that you need. Yeah. So what is that missing link then that you, you see for first responder wellness? Right, so the, I think that the missing link is the focus solely on uh, the worst case scenario, which is the big drag in the room PTSD. Yeah. Um, after the call and what I do is all about mental wellness for first responders, which means we need to be looking at depression, anxiety, marital issues, addictions, all of these things because they all affect it uh, leading up to that. And if they go unchecked, which, uh, you know, if we're setting up the things like we're setting up, it goes unchecked until you have that big bad hard, difficult, and life-destroying disorder. Right. Um, so I think the missing link is pulling back a little bit to say, okay, even though you're first responders and we, we've bring great light to, I think, something that's been under the, you know, in the shadows for a long time, that now we need to talk about it's not just PTSD, but it can be anxiety, it can be depression, and that's okay too. You can have those things, and, and that's a normal thing to experience. So let's talk about it, make it normal, and let's not stigmatize it or, or say, the, you know, you're a first responder, you're the hero type, that cultural hero type, yeah. so thereby you can only have the worst case scenario thing, right? Yeah. So, and when people come to see me or they ask me questions, that's the first thing that they open with all of the time. And within 15 minutes, I'm like, you know, that's, you don't have PTSD, right? You have whatever else. Um, and the relief that they get from that. So I think the message is just, if you're a first responder, that's what you have, and that's it's just not true. Right, so you're talking about the culture of like, you can man up, you can do it. Mm -hmm. How does that, that culture kind of go in with like substance abuse? And you're seeing like, maybe drinking too much, but it might even go further than that sometimes. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it, the, I, I say the great litmus test for culture is just Google it. So just Google firefighting, for instance, right? And the first million images are usually men, all in their gear, flames behind them, two axes kicking indoors, right? So Google is a great culture check for where we're at. Um, but a large part of the culture also, especially because, I mean, the majority of our fire departments, and I'll speak to fire specifically here, are paid on call volunteer, right? Yeah. So they're not the career folks that we, you know, everybody wants to be, um, but they're the, the rural guys and girls that are out and they have other jobs and other careers. Um, and so when I started, Started, there was still a beer fridge, not in my hall, but still in you know around uh, yeah. where I was, right? And it was very common to do a call, come back, crack a beer. And the thing about that is, if if you do a call, come back, you're feeling a little bit of you know maybe weird about the call, you feel off about the call, the call bothers you, you crack a beer and you drink it, and you notice you feel better, right? You just rewarded yourself for that. Right. So then you go and you do another call, not addressing that first one, and then we start to get in that cumulative effect. You not address that first one, you come back, you're like, oh, you know what? I'll just have a beer, that's good, so I'll drink that, and then I'll, but now I'll need two, and now I'll need three, and it's a slippery slope because what we're not talking about in substance use, and this is culturally, not just in the first responder field, what we're not talking about is that that substance worked. Right. That's the thing, nobody wants to say that. Is that substance worked? The problem with that is, is that it doesn't work forever, and it usually has side effects, just like any other medication that you take. It has side effects, and if we're not paying attention, you know, then we're drinking too much, we're losing our jobs, we're losing our marriages, we're losing our partners, our families, um, because it comes with side effects. So that's that piece in that cultural um, 
within the culture it, that alcohol is allowed, right? right? And and now we have worse, well, I shouldn't say worse, but just harder things to deal with, right? With the, the opioid crisis that's going on. Yeah. Um, and the opioid works on the same brain mechanisms that emotional pain works on. Right. So you take it for physical pain, but then you take it on a day that you're having a bad day and you realize you feel better. And again, immediately you've just recognized that when I have a bad day, I take this and, and I feel better. And then that's how you kind of create that repeating cycle. Yeah, wow, yeah, for sure. Well, that can affect the first responders, obviously, but almost anybody could be affected by like the opioid or that kind of situation 100%. if they have a stressful day. Yeah, 100%. Uh, it's, I, I, and, and we're seeing it more and more. I mean, the opioid crisis is in full swing right now, yeah. so we're seeing it more and more. So what does the impact of a first responder world have on an individual then? So I think what we want to do is we want to blame everything that we go through on our careers. Um, and I'm not saying that this career doesn't contribute to it, right? The way I put it is, you know, first responder world is a career of trauma, but it doesn't right. need to be a traumatic career. Okay. So I think our emphasis on the, the job being the cause is misplaced as well, because this is a job you can't leave at the job place. There's no briefcase to leave, there's no paper, yeah. well there's probably paperwork you can leave, <laughs> but the, you take that home with you and then you take home life with you. So if you have a bad day and you take that home but you don't know how to talk to your spouse and then you get in a fight and an argument, go to bed mad and that never gets resolved. So you wake up mad and then you go back to work. It's just the cycle and uh, you know I always describe it as there, people always ask me why do some people struggle and others don't, right, right. for calls, right? And so normally I draw a line on, on the board or having a PowerPoint I draw a line okay. and I say that you know what you go through your career and you have a bad call you get a little blip but yeah. if nothing else goes wrong and life is good you know the blip up and down you go back to baseline but what happens when things just keep piling up is you get past that line that threshold yeah. and that's when you develop a mental wellness issue that doesn't mean that you're gonna develop post-traumatic stress disorder it doesn't even mean you're gonna develop anxiety disorder depression or anything like that but you're at a higher risk for it right. And so I think that that's, that's sort of that piece too, is that we want to blame the career, because we want, we, as humans, we need something to blame. Right, yeah. We want to blame something. And of course we're seeing these things over and over again, so that makes perfect sense, right? Logical one-to-one -one sense is, if I'm seeing this crap, that's what's happening. However, we're not taking into full effect that what's going on at home? Is home life not good? Like what's going on in these other aspects of your life? What's your social life like? Um, are you, you know, withdrawing from everybody? Do you have, do you not have a good friend group? Do you have all of these factors that are coming into place? And so again, we want to place the blame and, and uh, we want to place it on the job. And the job is one factor for sure, but we don't live at our jobs, right? And, and our jobs aren't at home, but we, we have a lot of kind of cross contamination of both of those right. and so we need to take that into account right not by the power of anything else right well I think what you're doing is a big thing too right because putting all this information out there for free on the internet you kind of bridging that stigma because then they don't if they're afraid to go to a counselor they don't have to be afraid because they can go to your website and get started right yes. yeah and everything I do is confidential so I mean if you uh, I don't offer like online counseling or anything right. like that that's a little bit of, but if you say this is what I'm experiencing like what's up um, I'll have a conversation conversation with you about you know where you're at who can you reach out who, who can you talk to who do you trust right even if you got a, a couple of close friends where you can just have that real raw conversation with like how many people have that right yeah, think about sure. that yeah. how many people would you go out to and say you know what I'm just like I just slept for like three days and I don't think that's cool and you know I can't I'm not eating and I'm not sleeping like we don't just as people we don't say that right so it, you know I understand that when I'm talking about the first responder field but it's just so much much more important and if we take it back to that Google image if we're looking at a culture where we tote these people as heroes if we can get them first to be doing the talking it becomes then okay for the rest of the culture yeah, absolutely. these are the heroes these are the you know these are the people that we see up here on these tiers and they're doing that that's got to be okay for me to do it then yeah. and we start them early right we start them way back here at like education in at a young age so when they're in those careers you know you and I won't be having this conversation 
conversation anymore because my website won't be needed and, yeah. and this stuff won't be needed because the conversation started back here and they know how to cope and deal with it, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's the idea, right? Is like we'd, ho we'd all hope in this, in this field of dealing with PTSD that we will probably still have to deal with, always have to deal with it. It'll be a condition, but that we can deal with it more openly yeah. and less behind closed doors. And, oh, yeah, I can't talk about yeah. that. 100%. And we're training them early to do it. So if we yeah. move this stuff into school education programs, they're a reflection of the field. Yeah. Right. So if if I know that, and you know, as a college or a university, whatever, if I know that when they leave my institution and get a full time job or get a job somewhere else, that they're going to be exposed to peer support, they're going to be exposed to trauma, and they're going to be exposed to situations that at least they're going to induce stress. Right. And they're going to be expected to know how to cope and be comfortable in a situation where they have to do that, I'm going to start offering that at my educational institute. Because then, I, now I've got a leg up on everybody else because it's like, well, our folks are trained in all of this stuff out of the gates, which means they're more resilient, more able to do the job, better suited, right? And But because we don't have that yet, we're getting there, we don't have that yet, um, the institutions won't follow. There's no point, right? There's no incentive for them to because at the end of the day, they're businesses, right? But, yeah. but if we start way back there, then, you know, it's it's all in the the beginning stages, right? It's all at the yeah. front front game, and then the, the we can play the long game, and we'll be better suited to do it. Absolutely, yeah. You don't have to learn those skills later in life. You're, yeah. you're built with them yeah. when you're growing up or you're training for that field. Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing that you know I hear a lot. And one of the things that bugs me is, you know, if you develop a disorder or an issue, you're not cut out for this job. Right. And that's so wrong. I was just bringing it back to the whole hero aspect. Yeah. You got to get out of here because you don't have the right stuff for this job right. anymore. Right. And, you know, I explain it with like why, you know, we all have this line. It's just, yeah. you know, depending on where it's set. Um, but at the same time, we're all humans mm -hmm. and we're none of us are trained with these things. We're, none of us have these skills, right? It's not in kindergarten or grade school or, you know, if we're at home and we get these skills and you're super lucky, but we're not taught how to cope with an emotional skill especially as men right like yeah. you're not allowed to express anything but anger and no emotion those are <laughs> yes. the right the stoic or you're just you know angry yeah. um, and so when you have to deal with something like guilt and shame right, you're not well equipped yeah. you're not well suited and you know what none of us are some of us have natural tendencies to talk or be open about that mm. to be vulnerable and mm. oh, don't like be vulnerable and be a first responder those things are they're mutually exclusive right they don't go together so it's training them to say right when you're here in this moment you're human right and so as a human address these things right guilt shame worthlessness hopelessness feeling you know useless all of these are normal feelings 100% right. normal feelings so let's own it let's own that we feel those things once you start having that conversation other people are going to start having that conversation. Wow, yeah, absolutely. We were talking earlier about your, your book and how it might be a good thing for family members to read. Yeah. Could you give some tips to maybe some family members that may be watching about like what they could do if they have a, a family member that's in this frontline service yeah. work? Well, 100%, I think that the first thing that you should do is before they get into there, if you're at that stage, have a conversation with them about the expectations and the realities of what's going to happen. Right, set some ground rules kind of. Right, and, and I think it's a really good thing to bring, you know, if you can, bring your spouse uh, in and talk to somebody in the service and say, okay, you know, what can I expect with my day to day? We don't, we're uncomfortable with that idea because we know what they're going to hear and that's just not fair, right? Because they're going to hear about it anyways or they're not going to hear about it and not understand what's going on. But if you're both on board, then you've got the buy-in and so now you've got a bit of a partnership there. The second thing you can do is start early with talking. Okay. and having that conversation and being okay with that conversation. So okay. I have to open it up to you to say, when I come home and I say I've had a bad day, that's not good enough. That's just not good enough. Give me more words, right? I need, use your language, use your words. Give me more words on a bad day. That tells me nothing. Right. It's like, oh, well, I had a bad call. Closer, right? Okay. I had a bad call, but I, and don't talk about the details. They don't need to hear that, right? But say, you know, I had a bad call, and I didn't think that I did everything I could have done or I felt like I could have done more. Right. Tells them a bit more and they can then give you that feedback that we need, right? Or give you that consoling or at least give you the time and understand that you're struggling. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, in the next little bit, I'm going to... 
I'm gonna witness some stuff and I can support you in that. But if you just come home, I have a bad day and start slamming things, right? Nobody has any clue what's going on at all. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then they like, get frustrated. 100%, right? Like you feel like you got your message across because you're slamming doors, clearly I'm angry, right? But they have no clue what's going on. So that talking piece, but then there's the listening piece. Yeah, absolutely. So when I say that I've had a bad day, you you have to be listening enough to, to know to ask follow-up questions. So in that, so talking, listening, go together. Yeah. But also listening to underneath that, right? Because you know your like your your spouse or your partner or your friends or your family, they know you the best. Yeah. So when you say have a bad day, right, they can instantly tell, okay, you're off a bit. Let's ask some probing questions. You know, an interesting uh, stat, if I can, or not not sure. stat, but research is, you know, if you research the burnout of social workers, therapists, and there's hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of articles, right? The burnout of family in a relationship. There's, there's nothing there, oh. right? Especially for first responders' families, right? There's not, there's no research. There's nothing oh, there, right? So it's like, if we can, and, and they're like the first ones that we could set up to prepare for this, yeah. and and our, and this is why I bring them to my talks. This is why I wrote the book for families, um, and and this is why I think it's crucial to bring them into all of these aspects, because a they should know. Um, and be aware, they should have the buy-in, but then once they're aware and have the buy-in, it's easier to start those ground rooms around talking and around listening um, and around supporting. Um, and I think that those are, you know, if people could walk away with three things or two things that I think are the most beneficial, it's just being able to talk to your partner yeah. uh, in a real deep level kind of way and being able to listen to what they say non-judgmentally. Right, so you can't make any judgments, or at least not in that moment, right? Because that's when they need the support. Yeah. But it's not one-sided. Right. Right. And, and now we're getting a little bit away, but you know, in a partnership, it's not one-sided. So it's not that you can come home and have a bad day and expect this, and then when they come home and have a bad day, to be like, well, whatever, just you know, do what you you normally do. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Like, oh, you you, you got. I'm a police officer. You work in like an accounting office. You had a bad day. Whatever. You got it. You got to say, oh, we have a bad day. Well, tell me about it, please. Yeah. What happened at work? Yeah. Exactly. Well, what happened? Yeah. Right. Or or not maybe what happened again you don't want to like as a first responder the gory details doesn't help anybody right right but um you know what happened was well i had a bad call you know and then this happened you know i lost somebody or uh, i made a mistake or whatever right i went to a call and you know we always think that the headliner calls are going to be the big calls right and this is what you see in the paper all the time the big accidents the big uh, scenes those are the headliner calls that make the paper and then we we hear about you know the fallout from that um, from the folks that i've talked to the majority of the calls that bug them are like the things that we'll never hear about because they're like they're medical calls to you know so we get a call to somebody who's not breathing or, or suspected to be dead but we show up and they look like a family member right or they show up and they look like a friend those are the ones that rattle us the most or at least in my experience those right. are the ones that rattle me the most and the calls that I remember most aren't the big headliner calls that you know made the paper it was those calls where it was like real raw emotion or somebody reminded me or somebody right and it's yeah. and so it's it's taking away that everything that makes the paper is going to be the the big thing right. and that it's the small ones too so being able to come home and say you know what i went to a call and someone reminded me of mom or dad or whatever and that was hard for me to deal with and it's like oh okay we can work through that right yeah, and so i think those are the most important rules and i think the two biggest things that they're missing right now is being able to talk and listen to each other yeah. uh, because of the machoism because of the culture um, so if we start to break that down and we're seeing ground being you know, made, um, but if we continue to see that happen, I think we're going to continue to see improvements. Awesome, great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Nick. Now, could, where could people go? What's what's the website? We actually actually said that for yeah, after the so, call. Uh, the website is afterthecall.org. Okay. Uh, pop on there, and, and we've got all kinds of resources. A uh, good place to just keep up because I'm not so good at keeping up with the site is Facebook. Right. So find us on Facebook. Super active there, um, and I have a public profile that you can find me on. Uh, so if it doesn't fit, kind of in the after the call scope, I'll post it up on mine. Um, I'm writing lots of articles going out in different publications and magazines all over the world. Um, and I always throw them out on, on there. And I'm on Twitter as well. Um, and uh, my email is plastered on everything. And you can get a hold of me over Facebook or, or Messenger or whatever. And, and I think that's the easiest way to connect. Excellent. Well, thank you so much yeah. for your time, Nick. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.
here with Jill and Sean. First of all, guys, uh, how did how did you two meet and get this project going? Well, uh, we actually went to school together. We went to paramedic school together. Oh, yeah. And then uh, once we got out of school, we were both working for the same service. And then, uh, yeah, we just, it was a huge epidemic and still is of first responders dying by suicide. And we just thought that um, we would put something on social media and see if we could raise some awareness in regards to what was going on. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen the posts on social media, and and the uh, you've got the T-shirts too, and sweaters, and little uh, you know stickers that people could put on their cars just to help support, right? Uh, so, uh, what prompted the launch of this this campaign? You kind of said because you went to school together, but was there like a, a certain event or an impetus that got it going? We had been, I guess, working as paramedics for a couple of years, yeah, and. Uh, I just remember being on Facebook and seeing um, all these updates constantly of first responders dying by suicide. Mm -hmm. And Sean and I got talking and said, you know, no one's really, no one's really talking about it. It's, it's almost like it's not comfortable to talk about in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to start this, this conversation. Mm -hmm. And we started it on social media and here we are. Right. So what's the best way then if, if people wanted to find out more about this organization, where could they go? Like obviously if they just search the hashtags on Twitter, it'll probably pop up really quick, but is there a website or something? There is. It's uh, I've got your back 911com Okay. And then okay. we have an Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Right, awesome. So how many hours a week do you guys spend working on this project? Mm -hmm. I think we're afraid to add it up. To <laughs> right. um, I think throughout the course of the day, you'll probably find both of us on our social media for at least four to five hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just social media. Wow. And then everything else that we do in between. So going to conferences, yeah. speaking at conferences, um, just being involved with different events. Right, right. Any future projects related to this in the works for you guys? Um, yep. Uh, we're, <clears throat> excuse me, in the process right now of um, opening up a... Uh, no one really knows this yet, but a retail shop. Oh, wow. Awesome. St. Thomas. So we're hoping once it, it gets fully sort of functional to maybe employ some first responders who are off work. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, if possible. Right. We've been talking in the documentary about different ways to deal with the stigmas of PTSD and PTSD in general. So maybe that is a therapeutic way for some uh, first responder to deal with it, being working in the shop uh, if they've got some off time or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the initiatives that we have right now is um, just knowing that there's a lot of people out there that, that do follow us and we just can't be everywhere where we get invited to go. So one of the things that we started to deploy is we have a couple people out in the East Coast, some people um, out on the West Coast, north of Toronto. And so when there's a conference or something going on, we will send a bag of our product with you know, merchandising material and everything else yeah. to a particular person. They'll go to that event for us and represent us there. Awesome. Um, they'll have our product to sell. And it, uh, it, it works on a couple different levels. We get those people that um, have been off work to get them back out socializing again, usually with first responders. So yep. it's a very uh, comfortable community that they're gonna be with. Um, usually they're struggling financially as well if they're fighting with WSIB and their claim and everything else. But it gets them back out socializing again, gets them to an event where there's people that have things in common with them. Yep. Um, and they get paid from us to be there, plus mm -hmm. they're representing us, plus we're selling our product there. Right, yeah, if you can help just like one mm -hmm. first responder Absolutely. and Even, get back in, yeah. that's worth it, right? Absolutely. Even a free meal, Absolutely. do you know what I mean? Like yeah. people are truly Absolutely. struggling, some yeah. people cannot afford food right so, they so go to these conferences they get a lunch they get a dinner they get a breakfast yeah and they get to socialize and get them out of their house where yeah. they like to just stay and get out of the limelight and get right. out of seeing with, and interacting with people and it forces them to do that by going to these conferences for us they can work as little as they want yeah. or as much as they want mm -hmm. that's awesome so what are some of the major obstacles you guys may have encountered in this journey uh you know Let's be honest, the stigma about yeah. mental health. Um, when we first started, we were uh, told by a number of people to be careful with what we do, with what we're doing, uh, where this campaign goes, because we're going to meet a lot of obstacles and roadblocks, and we have. Um, and again, just uh, 
uh, with legislation too, you know, getting that legislation passed and right. all the hurdles and obstacles for that. Absolutely. Well, you know, it, it's pretty, it's probably very nice for a first responder to be driving around in their own car or in better word of lack of a word, the company car and uh, to see somebody have that sticker on the back of their rear windshield, right? Just to say, hey, we got gotcha. you. We, yeah. we get excited about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think I saw five of them yesterday in St. Thomas oh, wow. and I still get super excited. Awesome. So, yeah. So in a short three years, I think we've done over 27,000 stickers. Oh that we've been able to send out yeah um, and you know even crossing the border you know somebody will notice one of the border guards will notice a shirt and they'll comment on it and they're wearing one of our bracelets at the border awesome. it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty crazy awesome well Jill Sean thank you for your time and you know if the people watching want to support first responders this is probably an easy way just to slap a sticker on the car and say I got you right absolutely that's right, right. yeah yeah thank you thank, thank you. you appreciate it yeah Well, thank you very much for joining me for the documentary Overcoming Obstacles. I want to give a very special thank you to Deborah McDonald, uh, the organizer of the Invisible Wounds Conference and the driving force behind getting this documentary going. Again, a special thank you to Leslie Ford, Mark and Don Leslie for helping to sponsor the uh, documentary and, and get us uh, going on this. It's a very important issue, uh, as we've heard through the documentary, for the frontline support workers to overcome these mental illnesses and uh, get the support they need, uh, feel that it's okay to talk about these things. Uh, it's no longer a stigma. We need to break that stigma down and let them know that they're human and uh, they can talk about it too and, and we're here to listen. So I hope you enjoyed the documentary, learned a lot and uh, you know go out there and thank a frontline support worker for the job they do. Sit down, maybe have a coffee with them and let them chat. Uh, they probably would really enjoy the experience and, uh, and just give them a special thank you. So for more information about the Invisible Wounds Conference, you can always visit their website website and I uh, thank you very much for watching. The preceding program was brought to you by Bruce Telecom and Whiteman TV.